Hello everyone, this is Flower Girl J. Once again with another chapter in my Healing Chronicles. Now today is very special because I told you guys a lot about my goddad helping me uh, realize what I was in. And also I t I've talked about how he has helped me a lot in my deconstruction process. And one of the lessons that God had taught me when I came out was that not all leaders are spiritually abusive and out to get you. That was like the first lesson that I've learned. And I learned it through my God dad, as, as I've talked about. I've learned it through my God uncle, who's a pastor in Chicago. I've learned that from even my other god uncle not not brothers to this god dad who actually is with us today but um i've learned that there are good leaders out there and today we're going to be interviewing my god dad his name is marceline king paul he's originally from florida he moved to georgia one minute and now he's in jersey so everybody, this is my God dad. Say hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> How you doing, Jasmine? How you doing, God dad? <laughs> so everybody's been I'm excited good. to meet you <laughs> and are curious to know about you. Because not a Amen. lot of leaders Amen. open their hearts and are have taught what you've taught me. Right. Right. So. Right. right. My first question is, how long have you been in leadership? And tell us about yourself, like your ministry. I know you you have a church a in Jersey. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm from Orlando, Florida. Not, not born, but the majority of my life has been in the state of Florida. God has moved us now to the state of New Jersey. We're doing our work here um, in the uh, small little town of Thomas River, New Jersey. Um, did a little ministry work in Georgia, so yo, got an open door for us to travel. Now, uh, becoming one of my evangelists, and I just thank the Lord. My total years of being in ministry, oh, we talk about uh, when I gave my life to the Lord, being reborn again, it's been 21 years. And as far as my teaching and preaching and pastorship, it's been 17 years now. So, you know, I learned a lot being in the field. You know, so I just bless the Lord for where he has brought us from, where he has brought me from, and where he has taken me to now, you know, and, and just thank him for a lot of the souls that we were able to, to help and bless, you know, that has been blessed through my ministry. Yeah. Certainly it's been a blessing. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So a lot of this channel is about how I got out of spiritual abuse through um, the yeah. organization, well, the church that I was associated with, which was part of an organization mm -hmm. called UPC, which is United Pentecostal Church. And there have mm -hmm. been a lot of people who have been a part of that, as well as, you know, just part of legalism and spiritual abusive organizations and churches. But have you ever been mm -hmm. a part of UPC, UPCI, which is United Pentecostal International, or uh, WPA, which is World Pentecostal Association? Never been a part of the organization, but I am familiar um, with it. I deal with, with a lot of leaders. And earlier, you asked me to tell a little, a little bit about my ministry as, as we get into that, because I've dealt with a lot of leaders. Um, 2004 is when I started pastoring. My ministry targets um, era, tradition, set things in order in the house of God. We deal mainly in deliverance, deal with souls of salvation and helping people to become like Christ. So I, I find myself pastoring, find myself teaching, and you know, as I uh, every Sunday morning, as the doors are open up, and every Wednesday night as we go forth. And our Bible teaching was finding leaders are walking in through the door. I didn't understand that at first. And the Lord told me that I was going to deal a lot with leaders and help restore a lot of pastors. And there were pastors and bishops and apostles uh, from every fivefold ministry, from every auxiliary you can think of that walked in through the door and was able to teach them. God said, I'm sending them to you for, for the 
them to be restored. Teach, talk, and then send them back out. Many of them are coming in there. They're coming in broken, need to be healed. And, and I find myself doing that. I didn't understand that in the beginning of my pastorship, but then, then I understood that a couple of years later, you know, why God was sending a lot of leaders my way, you know. And so that's, that's the main thing that our ministry targeted. Uh, it's, it's a lot of leaders and not just lead, people who are already in leadership, but those who God has called to minister, to preach, to teach, you know, and even some to become pastors. So we dealt with uh, uh, preachers and ministers from all type of all kinds of uh, background, walk of life, from different organizations, from cult, from you name it, from every uh, denomination there was. They have come into the church and we were able to minister to them. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the organization because we had a few people that have come to our ministry that we had to minister to that's come from that uh, same organization that uh, you was a part of. And that's like truly amazing because a lot of leaders are not willing to do that, like uh, train up people to be disciples as they should. And we, right. yeah, it's all about, mm -hmm. you know, one person. Especially right, right. where I came from, um, you all you had to you had to work for the pastor. You know, you had to do everything. Mm -hmm. You had to submit mm -hmm. under the pastor. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about right. this in my um, other videos. And if you were black, you can just forget it. Especially a black man trying uh, and who's mm -hmm. called to be a minister. No, no, you'll never step behind the pulpit. You'll only be serving. Mm -hmm. Well, you, well, you know what Jeremiah 3.16 says, and I would give you pastors after my own heart. You know, because when I came into this uh, this, this office of pastoral shit, this wasn't something I, I wanted to do. Matter of fact, I didn't even know that I was going to become a pastor. You know, I even asked the question, God, what, why did you choose me? I mean, what is it about me that you want to use? And we can kind of see Moses into play. Because Moses even said the same thing. I think you got the wrong person. It looks like I can't even talk right, my speech, and, you know, I, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm not educated like the rest of them are, so I think you got the wrong person, God, you know, so that's how I was in the beginning, so when I think about Jeremiah 3, 16, I would give you pastors after my own heart, but God is saying, is that I'm going to give you pastors that, that will care and love my people, that will care and love my people, train them, feed my people, so in other words, pastors come, we are to serve the sheep. I'm not saying that sheep don't serve their pastors, but we've come to, you know, Jesus said, look, I came to serve, not to be served. And this is what Jesus did. He washed their feet. He talked them. He slept with them. He ate with them. He ministered with them. He cried with them. You know, so he imparted into his disciples, and we ought to do the same thing as pastors. So, and, and, and another thing, too, is that, that when you're called to be a minister, you are on call. That's exactly what it is. You are on call. Let me say, any given time, you need to be willing to get up and go as the Spirit leads you to minister to God's sheep and minister to God's people at any given time. And one of the things that the Lord showed me, it's my heart, it's my condition, and it's not right. If I'm not ready to lay down my life for the sheep, then I need to really sit down for a minute and really, really take that to heart and really think about that for a minute. Because we need to be able to give our lives for the sheep. And I'm not talking about anything foolish, but I'm talking about for their salvation. But if you're ready to do that and lay down your life for someone else's salvation, I can say that, you know what? You're ready. You're ready for ministry. Exactly. And, I... and not all leaders are like that. Not all leaders are like that. Not all pastors are like that. They may say they are, but a lot of them are not. When you ask that main question that I just said, Many of them are not ready to lay down their life for the sheep. Uh, and I believe we find that in John 15, no greater love than this is that a man will lay down his life for a friend. Absolutely. Amen. And the greatest love is not learning to love yourself. It's the song says, amen. Learning to love yourself it is the greatest love of all. That's not the greatest love of all. Amen. That's that's self glorification, but but learning and if we're willing to lay down our lives for a friend, that's the greatest love of all. And that's the love that Jesus performed. And I believe we all need to remember remember that not just pastors and leaders, but we all as 
sons and daughters of the Most High God. We, we need to remember that, you know. Yeah. Right. So when did you start referring to yourself as apostolic or uh, Pentecostal? I know you have, you, I think you referred yourself mostly to apostolic, mm -hmm. but right. like, yeah. Right. And, and I believe you have, uh, because uh, when, when you say the word apostolic, people incorporate that, uh, understand that an organization, uh, the UPC uh, organization, two different things. And, and what I mean by apostolic is we find in the book of Acts, and I'm talking about the apostolic movement with the Acts of the Apostle, same thing that Jesus taught his disciples and how they used to do things in the Old Testament versus the way that they're doing things in the New Testament. You know, when Jesus gave his disciples power, he sent them out by twos. They came back. What is it? Luke chapter 10, verse 17. He said, I beheld Satan fall down like lightning from heaven. They was astonished. They were amazed because they told Jesus, they said, listen, <laughs> this is amazing. This is awesome. We were able to cast out demons in your name. They had never seen it done like this. They did it the traditional way. And, and, and so we see the apostolic movement in the name of Jesus Christ that we can do all things. And this is what they did in the acts of the, of, of the apostle. They were demonstrating the powers of God, demonstrating the anointing, the move of God in the acts of the apostles when they went to these different churches. That was the gift of the laying on the hands, the speaking in tongues, the activations of the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit was all in play. The apostles was doing this. They tore down the walls of tradition, tore down uh, uh, the, 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 the spirit of error, set corrections in the church, in the house of God. And this is what they dealt with. You know, pastors who had questions concerning uh, salvation or concerning uh, mysteries of revelation or or the word of God, these apostles, they came in with the revelation, with the mysteries and the understanding, and they would bring understanding and clarity to the, to the word of God and to a lot of these pastors who didn't have it. And that's what they did. They set things in order. That was the apostolic movement then. That's, that's, that's what we fall up under. The acts of the apostles, the demonstrations of the gift of the Spirit, the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. <laughs> I can say a lot more about that. See, Amen. See, like, we, we like, people who came out of organizations and cults like mm. me and my audience mm. have we only were taught uh, when we refer to apostolic mm. we refer to acts mm -hmm. 238 that's like the the standpoint nothing else acts 238 is that's what mm -hmm. we believe and that's what um mm -hmm. <laughs> like what the evidence of speaking in tongues like you had to speak in tongues we weren't really taught mm -hmm. about the fruits and how the rest of the book of Acts. If you asked me back then, what mm -hmm. did I learn from Acts? Acts 2, 238, that's what I would say. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and we they just we, yeah. we just leave them up in that room speaking in tongues. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. leave them in that upper yeah. room. But they did so much more. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called Acts of the Apostles. It was more than one act. Mm -hmm. but yes. right. You know, the apostolic movement also consists of, of the activations of gifts as well, um, bringing clarity to the word of God, like I said, and also helping people to identify who they are in Christ. There are a lot of people that come to church today, there are a lot of people that have been in ministry or been in church for 20 years, 30 years and still have not reached their full potential. You hear people say, you have potential. What does that mean? I have potential. You have potential. Unused ability, which means one of the greatest fights that we have had before we gave our lives to the Lord was you receiving eternal life. Now that you have received eternal life, the fight shifts from keeping you from receiving eternal life, now it's keeping you from inheriting the full blessings of God and you reaching your full potential in God. You become a threat to the kingdom of sin. And that, that comes with a lot of distraction, confusion in the church, a spirit of error, uh, the, the, the uh, false teaching, false doctrines, and uh, false 
leaders, uh, pastors, prophets, apostles, as Revelation talks about. We have it. We're seeing that today during the end time. I mean, we hear and we have read about this in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the Old Testament, but now we're actually living it. We're seeing false prophets. We're hearing them. False apostles, they're out here in the world today, all over the world. Very prevalent even in this country. And like when you said um, the fight is like learning about who you are once you have eternal life, like I've noticed mm -hmm. too that like leaders who know people have gifts, they usually manipulate them, but not tell them what they have, but just manipulate it for their mm -hmm. own selfish yeah. gains. And me and so many mm -hmm. others have, you know, been used mm -hmm. in that way, Yeah, but not really knowing what we have, but being manipulated mm -hmm. and used. So. Yeah. I had a, uh, I was a part of a ministry some years ago before I started past. Matter of fact, this was the uh, last ministry I was a part of before I started uh, pastoring. And, and I can really call the ministry out. Um, my pastor at the time, this is pretty cool. You know, doesn't mind me testifying about it. But when I was a part of this, this ministry in Orlando, um, I knew that God was calling me out into leadership. I knew this. And uh, I was one of the key players there. For my pastor, not just one of the key players. I was his right hand man. I was, uh, and I'm a musician. You know, I played, I played the keyboard, I played the organ, I played drums if I had to. So, sing, you know, if, if I had to be praying and worship, I did it. You know, I don't like to sing, but if I had to sing, I sung. I, I, I was teaching on Wednesday night. Sometimes he would ask me to come forth and preach, and I would do that. I was, I was a very, very important person in his ministry. But I knew it was time for me to go. But what I was fighting with was, I don't want to leave my pastor. I don't want to leave my church. How can I tell my pastor? I had to find a way to tell him, listen, the Lord is calling me out. I need to go forth. And it, it took months and months. As a matter of fact, I think it was probably about eight months. Eight months. And finally, I built up the strength to finally go to him one night. And I waited. It was one Sunday night, uh, evening service that we had. And... Uh, right after service, I called him, him and his wife, to, to the side. We went outside and we talked. And I told him, I said, um, tonight will be my last night here. You know, but I want to continue fellowship. I just want your blessing because the Lord has called me, you know, to go forth and, and to pastor. And, and let me tell you what he said. He said we knew it was coming because God had already spoke to us. Now, when you're dealing with leaders, who heart is right for the Lord. They're not in it for what they can gain or, or whatever they, they can prosper out of it. But if their heart is right for the Lord, their heart is going to be for pleasing God and helping his people to become who God has called them to, to be. He could have helped me back and said, son, you need to go back and pray about it. Son, no, that ain't God speaking to you. Uh, it's just, but he, I know that this is a man who hears from the Lord. And his ministry, and his main purpose is to push me forth into my destiny. Now, he could have helped me that because I've seen this done in a lot of churches before where pastors have held members of their church back for a long time. They've been in bondage and kept them there for a long time. One is afraid of losing membership to tithing and offerings were going down <laughs> oh my lord <laughs> you know and so don't let you get and if you're a key player of that ministry they're going to do everything that they can to try to keep you there instead of pushing you into your purpose and pushing you into your destiny so there comes a self-glorification or a self whatever they can possibly whatever they can gain out of it and that goes to show you that there are so many people that handle God business selfishly for themselves. And it hurts the individual, and it hurts also the members of the church, and it keeps you from going forth and becoming who God has called you to be, to reach your full potential, you know, so... You got a lot of this stuff going on today, even in, in, in a lot of these churches. When we talk about UBC, not just uh, that ministry or that organization, it, it's pretty much in, it's all in all denominations, 
home. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm glad you said that because um, there's a lot of people um, that I have run into and have met that weren't a part of the UPC organization or UPCI yet they still went through mm -hmm. that kind of spiritual abuse and legalism in the churches. Yeah. And it's sad to see that majority of them are turning into that or have been like that for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a very strong, powerful spirit to break. You know, I, I, like I said, 21 years of being saved and 21 years of walking this lifestyle for the Lord. And the whole 21 years have not been easy, especially when I started preaching and pastoring. You know, the, the, the fight even intensified even, even the more. And one of the things that um, I see and I've learned throughout the past dealing in deliverance is I, I would rather preach to people out in the streets, you know, about salvation than to go in the house of God and preach to, to them and try to break this spirit of whatever it is. It, when we say a spirit of religion, trying to even identify if there is a spirit of just a religious thinking, you know, and the spirit of error off of the minds of the people to bring them out of bondage. So you have two assignment that is going forth and god has given us both of them there is an assignment for us to preach go out into the into the world as jesus has commanded his disciples in mark chapter 16 compel them baptize you know cast out demons you know so we're preaching and we're going out for the lost sheep the lost house of, of, of the lost sheep of the house of, of israel bring them in so that we can become one you know they need to hear about Christ and salvation. That's one assignment, but there's another assignment that's even greater than that. And that is the assignment to go into a lot of these church houses and preach to a lot of people who have been in captivity or have been in bondage for so many years under the false teaching, false doctrines of, of a lot of these pastors. And one of the things, and, and Jasmine, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you this, I've cast out a lot of demons in my time, a lot of demons in the name of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit has showed me is that he said, King, listen, I know you want to cast out demons and you're doing a great job, you know, he said, but I got something I want you to focus on. I want you to focus in, in my house right now. He said, there are more people in bondage in these so-called organizations and these so-called churches than there are people that are dem demonically possessed. Let, let me say that again. There are more people in bondage in these organizations and so-called churches than there are people that are demonically possessed. And God said, I'm raising a group of people today with an anointing like Abraham, that to go into these places and rescue Lot, rescue, you know, Moses went back to Egypt and said, let my people go. Bring them out of bondage. But you know what's going on? I'm going to tell you something. When they come out of bondage, what's going to happen is you're dealing with a group of people that are wandering in the wilderness. Now, where do we go from here? What happens now? I mean, what happened? And I thank God for you, and we prayed for you for so many years, and I thank God for what you're doing now in, in your ministry and uh, what God is using you to do. We pray for a lot of people. Who, but what happens after they come out of Egypt? They come out of bondage. They become what is called wilderness wanderers. Now that they're wandering in the wilderness, something is happening. God says, I want to bring you from, from slave ships. The championship. I want to bring you from bondage to freedom. I want to bring you to not having anything to possessing the land. So God says, there's, there's, there's a journey. I have a land. I have a place for you. You haven't reached that place yet. Now, the people have a journey that they have to take that's going to take them a few days to get there. That's it. Just a few days. But it takes them 40 years to get there. Why? Why is it taking you 40 years? to make it to the promised land when you couldn't make this journey in just a few days. 
Their problem was not physically, because physically they were fit. The Bible says that they were more mightier than the, than the Egyptians, much stronger than the Egyptians. They had the strength. They had the capability. They had the strength physically. Yeah, they can make it there. Their problem was psychological. Yeah, thinking. I heard someone said, someone said a long time ago, there's no such thing as a bad student. But if you got a bad teacher who taught that student his way, then what happens? That's not, the, that's not the worst. But just imagine how many other people that student taught the same way his bad teacher taught him. And now the saga continues on and on and on and on. We're dealing with a group and a generation of people that's been taught in that's been taught era, doctrines of men, different forms of religion, being a, a part of cults, different organization that's just not of God. But we have to be bold, like you and I today. We have to be bold to preach, to teach, and know the word of God as the spirit leaders to how to minister to these people, to bring them out of captivity, bring them out of bondage so that they can be free. You know, and, 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 and uh, we've, you know, I've learned this throughout the years, and you know, there's a lot of things that God showed us by the leading of the Holy Spirit, and there's some things that come by experience, you know. And so I just bless the Lord for my years of being in ministry and just learning, you know, and just obtaining wisdom, obtaining, obtaining knowledge and understanding so I can know how to minister to each individual person as we meet them, you know. And, and, and I've gone, I tell you, ministry has taken us all up and down uh, so far on the East Coast and yet to expand the ministry bill on the West Coast of the United States, but I know that he'll open up that door, you know, to see what, what the ministry work that he would have for us on the uh, west coast of the United States, but I know God will open up that door if, if it's his will. If he will take us there, if our ministry is needed, and he will open up that door, you know? And so we have been imparting, we've been teaching a lot of people who've come out of this uh, uh, man's way of doing things, uh, false doctrine and teaching, you know, that's one of the, uh, it's one of the worst Worst spirit, one of the worst things you can be up under, you know, versus just coming off the street, you know, and giving your life to the Lord. You know, but now you have to kind of like deep program, and I believe it's in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, chapter 18, where they have to be stripped from everything you think you know, everything you you've been taught of what you or what you know from the moment you gave your life to the Lord. You need to be stripped and the Bible says burnt. Consume all of that so God can reteach you all over again the correct way, the right way. Amen. Amen. Well, for it, it, and it's a process too that I've learned. Like you know, for some people it will be a like you know a short burning, but for some like me, it's it's gonna take a minute. But you, but you know, you just gotta be patient with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So were you ever um, a member of the apostolic churches or a leader of them or did you follow any holiness standards um, or legalism? No, not the uh, organization uh, uh, background that, that you are referring to. No, but um, I have... Um, I have been to some of these uh, ministries before, some of these organizations before, uh, in my years of pastor, and I have, uh, the, as one of their leaders, no. Being one of the members, no. Um, you know, like, you know, I've dealt with the, as I explained, the apostolic movement from the Book of Acts, what we believe the apostolic movement is, just at Chainbrook International Ministry, different churches that God has opened up the doors for us to go in to do revival and to preach, you know. And uh, that's pretty much it. Okay. Have you ever had to follow any holiness standards? Like, uh... you know, when you think of the word, <laughs> <laughs> when you think of the word holiness, man, you know, and I, I believe holiness 
uh, starts from the inside. You can't think of holiness without thinking about the word of God. And I believe it's in the book of, of uh, Leviticus that says that be holy for our God is holy. You know, and you think of holy. What is holy? That is anything unclean. Anything unclean. We don't associate ourselves with anything that is contrary to the word of God or that uh, thing that is an abomination of the Lord, uh, uh, to God. We have to remain clean, remain holy. And I'll give you an example from the, um, from the book of Acts. Peter is up on a rooftop, and he falls into a deep sleep, and he sees this vision, and he sees all type of beasts of every kind that is on a sheet that is coming down from the heavens, lit from every four corners. And this happens to him three times. The Lord says to Peter, get up, Peter, and eat. And Peter says, never have I put anything unclean into my body. So if you're unclean, you're not holy. But if you're holy, you're clean. What makes you holy? What makes you clean? God says, Peter, do not call anything common or unclean that I have cleansed or I have blessed. If God has cleaned us up, if God has blessed us, who are we to say that a person is not holy or is unclean? And we look at the outer appearance. We look at what a person has on. We look at what a person is wearing or how their hair style look or whatever. You know, it's, oh, it's just not holy. That's just nails looking like that's just not holy. You know, you got a nice spade and nice, oh, that's just not holy. That's just not of God at all. You know, or if you cut your hair short as a woman, that is just not holy. You look at them, you're looking at the outward appearance. What happened to the book of Proverbs? The book of Proverbs says that God knows us from the heart, from the inside. Huh? Does he do the work from the outside in, or does he do a work from the inside out? It starts within. Many of us need to discern and learn, discern from the inside who people are. And I believe the Bible explains it very plain and simple. You shall know them by the fruit that they bear. The fruit that they bear, the things that is coming forth from them, makes them holy, causes you to be holy. What type of fruit are you producing? This is not what goes in a man with the problem, but what comes out defiles that person. So if you're producing fruit of the spirit, okay, but they are manifestations of the flesh, then we got a problem. You know what you need to work on. Yeah. If your heart is right, your heart is clean, you love the Lord, you will do those things that please in the Lord. And if you love me, he said, you will keep my commandments. That is the word of the Lord. That is God's word. So I thank God that I have, I've had some good teachers throughout the years. Um, the impartation that I've received from my pastors throughout the years. And, I, you know, my pastors of uh, NAM stuff and uh, Pastor Kelly stuff out of Orlando, Florida. Their ministry was, was based on love. When I gave my life to the Lord and I, I became a uh, son of the Most High God, that was the very first thing they imparted into me, true love. Love is powerful. Love goes a long way. Love fulfills the righteousness of God. Love identifies who you are in him. Love is a fruit of the spirit. God is love. Jesus is love. And anybody teaches anything different or teaches holiness from an outward appearance, you need to run. <laughs> Go the other way. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> as a leader yourself, as a pastor, what is your definition of spiritual abuse and legalism? Well, we talked about earlier before um, when I was called to to minister, I was called to, to pastor, and I told my pastor at the time, and um he blessed me, gave me his blessing, 
And he said, well, son, I want, I want you to be all that God's called you to be, you know. And he released me. I said, there's some pastors that will keep you in, in their ministry for whatever they can get, afraid of losing membership. And then it keeps you from becoming who God wants you to be. You know, that's a form of, 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 of abuse. One where uh, dealing with the things of God. Not only that, is we have pastors who sit on a pedestal and they sit on a throne as their kings. They're, they're, they sit up in a high place and they want the members of the church to serve them, give unto them. The pastors should never go without. The pastor should be at this place. The pastor should be over here. You know, we've been taught that, you know, to always serve, 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 serve but they themselves won't even serve. Exactly. At all. Their heart is not even right to serve God's people. You know, that's a form of abuse as well. We find that going on in a lot of churches today. You know. Um, and you have pastors who would hide the truth from you. They know what the word of God says. They know the truth. Or something that they'll keep from you because they're afraid if they tell you and explain to you, give you knowledge of the word of God and give you wisdom of the word of God, things are going to change in their ministry. I mean, perhaps you may leave at this form of abuse. I believe it's Hosea 4 and 6 that says that my people, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. And it's not that God has not given us knowledge, but we are rejecting it. And we would say that Listen, if you got any questions concerning the word of God, you come to your pastor. When we're supposed to search the word for ourselves, seek the face of God, go to him. Mm -hmm. Ministry starts at home, not in the house of God. As a matter of fact, I met a pastor some years ago who was ministering to a married couple who had been married for 30 years, and they were going through in their marriage. And here's another form of abuse. The uh, wife had a problem with the husband, you know, because he was always working the majority of the time. She wanted him to be in church. You know, sometimes when he would come home, he was so tired, just, just, just sometimes he just couldn't make it to church. And so he had a problem because he felt like there are some days when he's home, you know, and the only time that uh, he has that he can spend time with his wife he wanted her to be home, spend that time with him. And she felt as though she needed to run to the house of God, run to the church, and spend her time there. There's nothing wrong with praising the Lord. There's nothing wrong with worshiping the Lord. There's, there's just nothing wrong with that. You understand what I'm saying very carefully. There's nothing wrong with serving. But there is something wrong when you're dealing with leadership. When you go to your pastor and you talk to your pastor about what's going on in your relationship, and your pastor tells you, well, listen, every chance that you can get, you need to be right here in the house of God. And your husband needs to be right here with you. What? Wait a minute. It, and that may sound like to us, well, He's giving them, he's giving her the spiritual counseling. Every chance that you get, you need to be right here in the house of God. No, no, no. You need to bring the husband, bring the wife together, minister them, minister to them together, find out the root of the problem, resolve the problem, and let her know, say, listen, this is your husband. You hear me? I'm not your husband. This is your husband. Ministry starts at home. They need to be unity at home first. How can you take care of the house of God if you can't even take care of your own house? How can you minister to anybody else if you're broken? Your house is not even right. I had to learn that even myself as a pastor. How can you do this? Right. Me and Lady Jane, we've had some issues. Throughout the years and throughout the, uh, in, in the past, throughout the years, we've had some issues. But the Lord has, has taught me, and she brought something to my attention one time because I was so focused on the members of the church. I was so focused on the people, on the 
on what was when. I would pick it up, you know, to where I was ignoring what was going on in my own household, and I allowed the enemy to come in. And so God spoke to me and showed me what I was doing. God does speak to his leaders. And he showed me what I was doing was wrong. My ministry and at my house need to be first and primary. Mm. My children need to be first. My, my wife needs to be first. It's the Lord who's first of my house. When we are married, then it's your spouse. Then it's your children, family, <laughs> then church. But they'll tell you, no, it's God. Church first, then your spouse and your family. That's error. That's not correct. And anybody who's been taught that, anybody in any of these organizations, you've been taught that, that's error. That's not scripture. That's not of God. God is not a God of confusion. Husband, love your wife just as Christ has loved the church and gave his life for the church. Jesus' main concern, his main primary was for his wife, and that was the church. Like, so our main concern and our primary ministry should be our household first. Mm -hmm. That's the first church you got. It's in your house. It's the first congregation you have. It's your wife and your children. And unfortunately, you know, the first people you're going to be preaching to and you're going to be teaching to is your household. But unfortunately, Go ahead, Dora. I, unfortunately, um, we, there that error has been spread and there's been a lot of people who've been divorced or gone through divorce and it's broke up marriages mm -hmm. and it's broken up homes i mean there's some people who they come out of that abuse but they're yeah. they, but their family's still there and um they can't have any contact with the family because you know basically when you're out you're cut off so people's families right. been cut off. I'm like, you know, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, you know, they put the they put the church first so much mm -hmm. that you know their family gets broken. Correct. That's 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 what it's designed to do. That's the enemy's plot, that's the enemy's will. Is to divide families, keep you from operating in your ministry. You know, one can chase a, a thousand, but two can put ten thousand. Mm -hmm. You know how powerful you and your spouse is mm -hmm. to come together in unity. We gotta join together, let no man separate. That is a commandment that is given to us. God says, "Now what I have joined together." Now listen, husband and wife, don't y'all let nobody separate this. We have let the enemy come in and crept in due to our ignorance. Like I said, Hosea 1 6 says, My people have perished for the lack of knowledge. Right. So we have to know the word of God. There was a young man in the book of Acts uh, who was reading the prophet Isaiah. I believe it was Isaiah 61. No, it wasn't Isaiah 61. I believe it was Isaiah 53. Thomas comes to him. He says, Do you understand what you're reading? It says, no, I really don't. I cannot. Unless somebody explains it to me so I can understand. The man of God took time, sat right next to him, and he explained, he read the scriptures, and he, he broke it down and explained to him what the scripture was saying. Then he got clarity and understanding. It is in God's will for us to get clarity and understanding in his word. And there's another uh, spiritual abuse that we go through is that and this is one of the things that I can say that I was that I was uh, was told by a pastor some years ago. I had a question. What are the scriptures in the Bible? And you know what he said to me? He said, "This is a mystery. The whole Bible is a mystery. Everything in the Bible, you're not going to understand. Every revelation you're not going to get. Every mystery is you, you won't get it." So that was the pastor. And I trust that the pastor is going to tell me right. And that's how we all felt. And that's how we all think. And 
until I started getting into the word and some uh, for myself and the Holy Spirit is leading me. We're supposed to understand. We're supposed to receive revelation. We're supposed to get mysteries. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, he says there are mysteries that has been hidden before the foundation of the world, that even if the princes knew, he hid these things from the princes of this, of this world, that if the princes of this world knew, they would have never crucified the prince of glory, the king of glory. But he said, but I have revealed them to my people through what? His spirit. What spirit are we talking about? The spirit of God. So it is in God's will for us to understand and know. And I'll give you another scripture to back up what I'm saying. They say that no man will know the day nor the hour of the coming of our Lord. Paul also encourages and tells us that there are some that are children of the dark. There are some that are children of the light. He says, now, however, concerning time, mysteries, he says, now you, uh, brethren, now he's talking to the church, are not children of the dark, but you're children of the light. He says, but that day shall not overtake you like a thief of the night. Yeah, it's supposed to come over the world like a thief of the night, but not to us. We're supposed to know. We're supposed to be ready. It is in God's will that we know. And Jesus told his disciples, no longer do I call you all servants, but I call you friends. He says, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. So by him saying that, he's telling us that he wants us to know what's on his mind. But if he calls us a friend, which means that I want you to know what I'm getting ready to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Your echo. Hey, man. Oh, no. Sorry. Let me I'm try to put to, you uh, down. That's all right. All right You're good. I'm trying to focus here. <laughs> do you hear the echo now? Uh, testing one, two, and two, two, one, two, three. No. Okay. <laughs> you got loud, folks. Yeah. <laughs> He gets I, deep, man. I get excited sometimes, <laughs> man. I tell you. And if you don't if you don't stop me, I just keep going. This is my area. I, I just love the word of God. And I love enlightening God's people. When we have been illuminated, the Bible says that we will we will suffer and experience great affliction. We have to know this. Once you have been illuminated, and your people, and I, I trust and I do know that you have a lot of Facebook followers, people that are Tuning into your channel and um, probably listening to this message, and they are being illuminated by what they're hearing today. You know, this is God's word, uncut, uncensored, <laughs> and it's full. We say the full gospel. Uh, this is the full gospel. And, and let me say this because when you're dealing with people who come out of tradition, uh, thinking, and spirit of error, who've been taught wrong when they come out of that and they hear what we're talking about today to some it sounds like some foreign language or another form of doctrine another form of religion like we're, we're preaching something they, they don't they're like, they can't understand what you're saying like, what is he talking about uh, can't be the work of god you know i taught a lot of people to receive truth but they hit when, when it comes to them because they've been in error for so many years. This is the only way I know. This is the only way I've been taught. This is the way my pastor taught me. My mother, my father taught me this way. This is the way, this is the only way I know. So when the truth comes, it's hard to hear it. Mm-hmm. Who can hear it? That's what the book of John says. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, that, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. He said, if any man would eat my flesh and drink my blood, he said, they will live. That many disciples walked with Jesus. Not the twelve, but some of the seventy disciples are saying, Man, this is a hard saying. Who could hear it? 
And you know what they did? They walked with him no more. Seventy disciples turned away. Wow. Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Will you also leave me? They replied. They said, No, you have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? Without you, do they realize where they help and they saw the resource come from? From him. Jesus is the everlasting uh, gospel, the bread of life. They understood that. So what they're saying is that you will have the majority of the church or the majority of people that will not hear you, that probably will turn away from what you're saying that you'll have just a remnant, just a handful of people that, that you can pull out of Egypt and pull out of this way of bondage to follow you into eternal life, to salvation, to be free. It's only a few. And the thing is, is that when you come out of Egypt, guess what? That generation of the people couldn't even make it into the promised land. It was only Josh, Joshua. Just a handful of people, a generation after that generation that came out of Egypt was able to make it into the promised land. This is a very dangerous, dangerous uh, place to be. It is uh, a spirit that we have to be aware of. And Jesus says, and he has warned us in the book of Matthew chapter 24, and even Paul has warned us. We'll give ourselves over to seduce the spirit. He says, I have something against thee in the book of Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3, because you have allowed this spirit to teach and to seduce my people, teaching them the ways of Baal false doctrine. So God's going to deal with these leaders It's what he's talking about. And you have to understand when we read Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3, who is he speaking to? He says, and I say to the angels, he's speaking to the angels who has been appointed to every church. Say unto the church. He's not speaking to the world. He's speaking to the church. And he says, tell these people I got a problem with what's going on. Tell them. I've been watching for a long time, and I told Ezekiel, tell them I have a problem. Do you see this son of man? Do you see this son of man of what's going on in the house? Do you see this? I'm going to ex execute judgment and has commanded the angels. I want you to go forth to slay, kill every man, every woman, every children, every beast, Everything, utterly destroy everything. But, but hold up, uh, let me get my people out the way first. Those who've been sealed, he said, don't touch them. He said, I want you to destroy everything, everything. But bef before you go forth, uh, by the way, uh, start in my house first. Then you take it out into the world. We know better. So judgment is coming to the house of God first before it takes before he takes it into the world. Mm -hmm. See, I'm getting excited again. Yeah. Oh, you are. <laughs> oh, man. The Lord's leading you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to be said, you know? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just like so many people in bondage right now. Mm -hmm. And like, there's mm -hmm. like so many people who don't even trust leaders anymore. I was gonna. Mm -hmm. The next question mm -hmm. was gonna be about the fivefold ministry. I mean, to be honest, God Dad, uh, I didn't really know about it till I went to class with you. I only knew about pastors. Yes. There was only one time it was um, taught, and there was the emphasis mm -hmm. on the pastor. But ironically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was that night that the Lord said, "That's what you are." When we like read in the Bible, we you know we the pastor was reading it and explaining each one, but mm -hmm. he really put emphasis on the pastor one. <clears throat> but he pretty much mm -hmm. our lesson was like you have to submit to these people. These are your leaders. You have to submit to your pastor. But it was just the emphasis mm -hmm. was on the pastor, not mm -hmm. the rest of the right. uh, of the four. But <laughs> emphasis was on the pastor. But that's when like I said, that's what you're gonna be, and I said. Right. That, that's that's not the mm -hmm. Lord. That's not the Lord. Cause one, women can't preach behind the pulpit. 
<laughs> like I can't preach. Mm -hmm. uh, pre uh, I can't mm -hmm. preach at all. I'm a woman, and plus, I'm a nobody. To, in their mm -hmm. eyes and that's and it does stuff into your mind it does like when you pretty much treat it like a nobody <clears throat> I can imagine you know? especially in an environment like that so I, it was really hard for me to believe I was like that's not me but it's like the Lord's like that's you I'm like no no I ain't hearing nothing uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not hearing right <laughs> Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until right. I got home, like it stuck with me that at home, that said, that's what you are. <laughs> and I knew it was God. And even mm -hmm. though I wasn't really yeah. close at the time, I was like, you know, I was starting to hear God's voice. But you know how you still trying to, it's like how you tuning into a radio station. That's how it was. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm still tuning and, and yeah. I was like, I was still un unsure if this was really God or not. But then I knew it was him because I know God, I, I know when uh, God talks to me, I know when I know for sure it's something I probably don't want to do or it gets me out of my comfort zone. But then mm -hmm. I, I, but then I asked him, like, you know, how could this be? I'm, I'm a woman for one thing. So that's out. And like, two, like. I don't have any experience or nah, 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 you know how, how is this supposed to happen but mm -hmm. right. flash mm -hmm. forward throughout the years like he's I finally learned what the fivefold ministry is it's not total submission to them mm -hmm. first and foremost it's total mm -hmm. submission to God first and foremost exactly. and the five exactly. are supposed to help you get to where you need to be mm -hmm. Exactly. But unfortunately, exactly. because of a lot of this abuse, people are mm -hmm. seeing leaders in a distorted, like the good ones. They're mm -hmm. the, even the good, the good ones. Let me just say the good ones are being mm -hmm. distorted with the bad mm -hmm. ones. If I'm saying it right, exactly. And those, yeah, and those that are doing it intentionally and know and know what they're doing, for whatever they can gain, operate a lot in the spirit of intimidation and manipulation. Which is witchcraft and operation. And see, I'm glad you said you know? that because when they, when when people do speak out like something's not right, or you know they try to talk to somebody about it, they blame it on the person being wicked and performing witchcraft. I know that happened mm -hmm. at my church that I left, the the second one. Um, he would blame people for gossiping and I, I put the emphasis on gossiping because it wasn't gossip. It was mm -hmm. something like, hey, I don't think this is right. People were starting to speak up, but then shut back down because they were scared of being a performing witchcraft and, you know, going against the man of God. That's, and even when somebody said the, um, you know, said something that they know wasn't mm -hmm. right or, you know, they spoke out, they would either say to that person that they were gossiping and, you know, they're pouring witchcraft. And if the pastor or the leaders do is doing something, God will take care of them. But they would keep mm -hmm. doing what, the, you know, they would keep doing that action. The Lord will handle right. them. Right. You know, right. just dismiss the concern and just mm -hmm. sweep it under the rug. Oh, oh, God will take care of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You have uh, leaders in some of these organizations that would not bring in a true man of God that is preaching the word and that is anointing. I say, I, I say the word anointing for a reason. Because I could have not operate in the level or the rim that God has allowed me to operate in if it hadn't been for the anointing on my life and being led by the Holy Ghost. You can't separate the two. David could have not played this instrument 
and drive out the evil spirit away from King Saul if he was not anointed. You can't do it. You can't drive out spirits and cast them out like that without the power of God. That's why he said, Jesus, I know Paul, I know, but who are you? I'm saying this to say this. When you're dealing with a group of people that are in bondage, <clears throat> and they have been in bondage for so many years, I'll give you another story from the book of Acts, chapter 8. And I love the book of Acts because, like I said, this is when you find the apostolic movement. And this is a good example right here. Uh, I believe it's Philip in Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> he is going from city to city. He's preaching the word of God. Then he goes into Samaria and he preached to them. And the Bible says that and the people of that city had been bewitched by one sorcerer named Simon who portrayed himself to be as God's powerful man or a great man of God or, you know, uh, deceiving these people with signs and wonders. And that's why you have to be very careful concerning signs and wonders because we think because we see signs and wonders, oh, that's the Lord. Hallelujah. We're triable people. We just look for something on that sign and wonders. They, 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 they. No signs and wonders were Follow they that believe, not lead them that believe. There's a difference. You have to be very careful. You would know them by the fruit that they bear. Simon is preaching. He's been preaching that for so many years, teaching the people in Samaria for so many years. Philip comes in. Never been there before. He's preaching. Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. The people... They give heed to Philip. Something is happening. Something. They said, wait a minute now. Something about this man and, and when he's preaching and he's teaching, what it is you're feeling is the power of the Holy Ghost. You're feeling the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You've been bewitched. You've been tricked all these years. You've been lied to, manipulated, bamboozled. When Philip comes in, the spirit that's been over this city can't help but to weaken. He weakens the forces of this seducing spirit, weaken the forces of this religious spirit, this pride spirit, this manipulating uh, spirit, this witchcraft that's been over the city for so long because of the power of the Holy Ghost. One man, just one man. So that goes to tell us that we're able to impact regions. This is the apostolic movement. Philip preaches. And the people believed Philip. The, the people in that city believed him. Even Simon himself believed. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the intriguing story of everything. They sent for Peter and some of the other and some of the other uh, apostles. Peter, excuse me, Philip is preaching in Samaria. The people believe by faith. And when Peter and the apostles get there, guess what they did? They commanded, they ordered them to be baptized. And guess what? The Holy Ghost fell upon them. And then we see the evidence of speaking in tongues. But that's not the only evidence that you got the Holy Ghost. There are other manifestations that are taking place, and I'll prove it to you, not just speaking in tongues. But in this story here, they're speaking in tongues. The Holy Ghost falls upon them. Simon is watching. I ain't never did this before. I ain't never operated on this level before. So he thought that he can pay for the gift of God, pay for the anointing of God. That's what some people do. Want to pay for the gift of God. You got a lot of preachers and I've seen this done where they'll try to prostitute me, prostitute my gift, my anointing, because, because they're not anointed. They'll put you out in the forefront and allow for you to get the crowd stirred up, get them moved up, 
with the power that's on your life, the anointing that's on your life. Get them stirred. Then they'll come right behind you acting like they're just as powerful as you are and they're just as anointed as you are. Uh -uh. I've seen it done before. Sit down. <laughs> Manipulation. I've seen it happen many times, many times before. You're not going to prostitute me using my gift. No. And I'm glad you no. said I'm glad you said that because that's what I was seeing at my first church and my second church. Uh, back to, from the begin from earlier from what I said about the uh black ministers and just not just black but just ministered mm -hmm. like men, men who you mm -hmm. saw was anointed. And they would mm -hmm. like that pastor, both pastors from my church would just use mm -hmm. them to stir up the crowd, like you said, just like that. But they yeah. would never get to preach. Exactly. Never. They would never like be coached. Or, well, you know, train you know how you train people to take on what God has called them to do? You help them. Exactly. Never got that. Exactly. And it was once exactly. in a blue moon. Once in a blue moon they would mm -hmm. allow them to preach a, a message. But other than that, exactly. no, that was it. Exactly. Right. At our ministry at Chamberlain International, God will show us the gift and the calling that's on a person's life. And we give them the opportunity to utilize their gift, utilize them to come forward. You know, most pastors, when you're on big, you can't do it, especially in uh, the Church of God of Christ, the, the Baptist Church. I've been, I've been, a, I've been, a, uh, I've been to some of these, these ministries that I was a part of for a few months before. You can't step up on a pulpit like that, just like that. You know, on Sunday mornings to preach, it ain't happening. You know, I know some of these other organization churches that that we see today, but I'm one who will push you into your destiny, help train you to become who God has called you to be. You have a gift, you're anointed. I want you to utilize that gift. Come forth as God has called you to. You know, most of these preachers won't let you do that. Then I was going to take you to a story in the book of Acts. You're going to say the only evidence was not just speaking in tongues. Paul comes to a group of apostles, I mean, uh, disciples in Acts chapter 19. This is where we find where the sons of one uh, high priest, Sceva, who goes down, calls himself, casting out demons. Paul deals with these disciples who he finds coming from somewhere, wherever they were coming from. He asks them a question. He says, Have you all been. Uh, that time since you believe? No, no, no. The question was, have you always seen the Holy Ghost since you've been since you've been baptized? This is what they said. Well, we haven't heard of any such thing rather of a Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? And that's how a lot of these people in church are in today. Keeping information away from you so you don't know. Because they know a lot of us are not going to read. A lot of us don't understand the mysteries and the revelation of God unless somebody explains it to you. Unless you seek the face of God. So Paul explains it to them. He says, you haven't heard of the Holy Ghost? They said, no. And look, what other baptism was you baptized in? Who was baptized under in John's baptism? Water. Very well indeed, Paul says, John baptized of water. He says, unto repentance, salvation. He says, but also, we need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because if y'all ain't got the Holy Ghost, then you ain't been baptized in the power of the Holy Ghost. See, there's a natural baptism. There's a spiritual baptism. God wants us to transition from the normal way of doing things or from the natural way of doing things to the spiritual way of doing things. In other words, from the way you've been taught how to do things to a more excellent that will please the Lord and cause you to walk in your destiny and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. When Paul does this, they're baptized. And you want to know what happened? They get up. Matter of fact, they were not dipped in water. If we read the scriptures, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them at first. I think there's one incident of what happened with, with Peter. The Holy Ghost fell on them, and Peter ordered them to be uh, uh, 
baptized in water, but the Holy Ghost had already fell on them before they got in the water. And that was Acts chapter, chapter 8. But Paul deals with these group of, of, of disciples, and they received the Holy Ghost. Guess what they did? They didn't just speak in tongues. They also prophesied. And that's another manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We have several different manifestations. We have prophecy. It's the miracles, the gift of speaking in tongues, the gift of, and then we forget about the gift of interpretations of tongues, but that's because that was done on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts with the apostles. A witness because people were there from all different types of nations and they heard their language being spoken there. And this is part of the apostolic movement. If God wants us to be taught, led by the Holy Ghost, this is the new covenant, he says. I will make a new covenant with my people. I will be there. God, they shall be my people. He says, I will teach them. Nobody will need to be taught. I, their neighbor, for all shall know me. Why does he say all shall know me? It takes faith. It opens up the door for you to get to where he is. And because you believe in him, it keeps you, and it takes you there to where God is. It's going to take knowing him to sustain you and to keep you where he is. And they that know that God shall do mighty things is what the word of the Lord says. Now, everything that I'm saying to you today is lining up in correspondence with Scripture to back up everything. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you will receive power, is what the word of the Lord says. When I dealing with a group of people that gave their life to the Lord, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. You have the life, but you don't have the more abundant. You don't have no power. You're not producing the fruit. You're not producing the manifestations of the gift. What are you doing after you receive the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost needs to grow in you. A lot of these leaders are in it for self-gain, for self-glorification, don't want the Holy Ghost to manifest or to grow in you because their office, their position will be in jeopardy because of God moving in you. One day, the Holy Spirit is going to bring you to all truth. And that's going to mess up their ministry. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm. As a leader, do you think that spiritual abuse and the damaging effects should be talked about in churches? I think so. Should it be addressed? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Jesus taught his disciples, you know. As a matter of fact, when we deal with uh, Acts chapter 16, the who do men say that I am? Some says you're Elijah, some says you're John, Jeremiah, or one of the other other prophets. Who do people say that I am? That's what they said. You are Jeremiah, Jeremiah, one of the other, one of these other prophets. Then Jesus says, now I want to know who do you say that I am? Peter replied and says, you're Christ, son of the most high God. In other words, before God can release to you power, you need to understand who he is and know who he is before he can give you power. Then he blesses Peter and says, Blessed are thou, Peter, son of uh, Bar, Bar Jonah. He says, he says, For ye is called the rock. Upon this upon this rock I shall build my church in the gates of hell shall not But before he does this, you know what the conversation he's having with, with his disciples? The conversation that he has with his disciples, he tells them to beware of the leaven. Uh, the Pharisees, the teaching of the Pharisees, beware of this. He didn't tell them to beware of the devil. Beware of principalities. Beware of demons. Beware of these men with their false teaching. False doctrine is what he told them. So that way he wants them to know what is going on out here. So I believe we ought to teach this. We as leaders, we as parents, we need to teach this. So our children... Our brothers and sisters, those who don't know, may know where you come from so that they don't fall under the same trap that you fell up under. 
So what are your thoughts about people yeah. who are not in church due to the fact that they have been abused or are too scared to come? Um, I know I read a chapter in the book of the subtle power of spiritual abuse. There was a woman who's been abused so bad, like every time she tries to walk in a church, she has to go see a psychiatrist or she starts shaking uncontrollably due to the abuse. Yeah. Yeah, and it's sad when we hear that. My heart goes out to them. They need to be restored. They need to be healed. And God wants to restore them. God wants to heal them. You got a lot of people who don't want to come to church because of what they see going on in the church. You got a lot of people who've been in the church that don't want to be a part of any ministry anymore, who've been in church all their life because of spiritual abuse. We are responsible for this as leaders. Those who are in it for what they can get have put up a, a, a bad taste and a, a bad name in the minds of those. Also for uh, the, the, the good pastors who love the Lord and that are in it for God and for his people. We got a bad name. A lot of these corrupt preachers that are out there today. You know, but, but we have to be able to restore them as Paul says in the spirit of meekness. We have to know how to restore them and how to minister to them. And not saying that everybody is going to be, is, is, is going to get an instantaneous uh, healing or breakthrough. Some things may take time. How long will it take? It may take as long as it will take. God spoke to Moses. Moses didn't answer the calling right away. He was a fugitive on the run for 40 years. It would take as long as it would take. It would take someone else 40 years to judge Israel. So it may take you a week. It may take you a year. Some people will say, well, how long, man? Get over it. No. You're not that individual. Everybody's different. You can keep on ministering to that individual until they have been fully restored. Exactly. What would you like to say to the people who are in the process of healing and gotten out? And what would you like to say to those who are still in their abusive situation? I believe that God knows the heart of every individual and I believe that he speaks to us there's a voice that we hear all of us and there's someone somebody that's listening to me right now that has heard and has just felt like man this just this just isn't right but I don't want to go against leadership and they feel as though because of the way they've been taught that they are going to be in the wrong but they God has been speaking to you there are signs and what kind of God would we serve that would allow us to be in bondage and he doesn't reach out to us? It is for the parents to reach out to the children first. Then the children will know the, their mama, their, their father's voice. God reach out to us. And so God has been speaking to us. There is a voice when you lay down at night. You feel something that's not right. You feel the voice of God is speaking to you. He'll speak to you through a loved one, through somebody. He'll tell you, listen, you need to get up out of this. Amen. This is the Lord speaking to you. You know, and then there's a demon on the other side of your shoulders. And now you better stay right there where you are. Your breakthrough is coming. Just just, just be submissive to, to leadership and just stay right there where you are when, the, when God is speaking. So if God does speak to you, what kind of God will we serve? If he doesn't, send us a word. Of deliverance. If he doesn't send us a savior, if he doesn't send us someone that can help us in our situation, what kind of God would he be? No, God does send people our way. He does speak to us late at night, in the middle of the day. And sometimes we come to a point where when we come to these organizations, these churches, it's like we get headaches and we can't even hear what the preacher is saying anymore. That's because God don't want you to hear that kind of stuff. He wants you to come out. And we just need to just hear the voice of God. And I'm saying, do not, do not, do not dismiss what you're hearing from the Spirit of the Lord. Do not turn away from the voice of God that he is speaking to you. God is speaking. This is, this is, the word of God comes. Almost salvation. If the people were here, when, when Jonah went to Nineveh, and he began speaking the word of God. God was bringing salvation to Nineveh. If the people were here, they would be saved. And the people heard the voice of God through this one prophet. God saved an entire nation. 
And God wants to save you from out of these places as well. You know, like these children and people who've been abused and a family uh, coming up as a child and abuse relationship. God have a way to bring in restoration and bring you, bringing you out of that situation and healing you. What you went through is not just for you, but as you come out, like what you're doing, daughter, you're reaching out to those that are still in it. When you come out and God restores you and delivers you, and he's using you to go back in and preach and teach and bring them out. You're going to have people that's going to come against you. They're going to throw stones at you. Man, my God, boy, don't they throw some, some, some stones. They're going to come at you and make you just feel like you want to give up. Who in the world do you think you are? You was born in sin and you teach us to be thrown out the synagogue. You're not, you're, you're not welcome back here anymore. But you got to keep on preaching. You got to keep on teaching. You got to keep on doing the word, keep on uh, doing the word of the Lord. What God has called you to do because your obedience is going to cause somebody else to be saved. Your obedience is going to cause for somebody else to be healed. Your obedience is going to cause for somebody else to be delivered. To be delivered. Jesus' obedience allows all of us who are here today to receive salvation and our part of eternal life and having it more abundantly. So there is a voice that is speaking to you. That is the voice of God. The angels of God is visiting you. Listen to the word of God. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. It's not that he's not given it. He's coming to us, but let's not reject it or dismiss it when we hear it. And I would just like to add to that. Like, also remember, guys, like, there is life after spiritual abuse when you get out. Like, I know a lot, mm -hmm. I know I was, and I know a lot of you out there mm -hmm. who are my viewers uh, have been watching uh, my story, and I don't know if I've mentioned, like, I've always been told if you step out of that church, you go on your way to a lake of fire, mm -hmm. you, you you going to mm -hmm. hell, and, and, you know, if you, but if you stay in here, you're going to be all right. But if you go out there, you're lost, you're a lost soul. And let me tell you that I when I did get out, I was scared, but then it felt like a heavy weight was lifted. So mm -hmm. there is life after yeah. that. Mm -hmm. There is life. Like I'm a living mm -hmm. witness yeah. that there mm -hmm. is life afterward. And mm -hmm. I would like to close with this saying. You just heard one of a good one good pastor. There are good pastors out there. There are good leaders out there. Like, there please are. know that. That was the first lesson God taught me when I got out. Because I didn't want to trust nobody. I didn't want to trust any leaders. Because, you know, it's like I was afraid I'd be manipulated again. And, like, there mm -hmm. are good mm -hmm. people out there. There are. Yes. Know that. I mean, he and God yeah. showed it through me through family. <clears throat> like I told you about my um, my God uncle in Chicago. Yeah, he and he's another good pastor. He's another good leader. And my God uncle, not related to them. They're, they're not related to this God dad. <laughs> but um, exactly. there are good people like out there, and they're good men. They're good leaders like out there. It's just, unfortunately, there's a whole ton of bad ones. And that's mm -hmm. reality, exactly. unfortunately. Yes. And you are not going straight to hell because you're not in a building and that you need time to heal. No, give mm -hmm. yourself time to heal. God is, and that's one thing also, like God showed me that He's not mad at me. He wanted me to get out of there. He, he, he and he's not, and I had to learn God all over again. He's not this guy with this big hammer just saying, "You're going to hell." Bam. Like, you know, <laughs> I had to learn God all over again. Amen. And let me say this too. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear the brimstone Scott opening up the earth and destroying the people. But that was for a reason. When they rebelled against God and they go against his commandments, you know, 
and especially when they were building idols and putting other gods before him. That that angered God. It provoked in the Lord. You don't, you don't do that. But they were doing that. And we would hear about terrible things that were being done in the Old Testament. And you need to understand, I'm glad you said I had to learn that all over again. And when Jesus came and he spoke to them and said, I am the bread that came down from the heaven. He says, if any man would eat, they would live. If you would drink, and this is the New Testament, this is what God wants you all to do, eat, and that's what you all are doing right now. You're having a spiritual communion with us today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Spiritual communion, I told you, there's a natural way of doing things and there's a spiritual way of doing things. This is a spiritual communion because you're eating and you're feeding the words that are coming out of our mouth today. You're drinking the blood of Jesus Christ, which, is, which, which gives us redemption. Without the blood, there would be no redemption. And this is what we're having today, spiritual communion. And so Jesus comes to say, listen, you know, God says, I am love. I just come to reintroduce myself to you all over again so you can know exactly who I am. That's what I want to do. God says, I want to reintroduce myself to you all over again. I hear somebody just see her crying right now. Yes, and just, just overwhelmed. Tears just coming down her face, sitting right on the side of the bed. Amen. God is speaking to you. And everybody else who is listening to this, who's been in bondage, who's been in captivity for so many years, hear the word of the Lord. This may be your only chance. Amen. God is giving his word over and over and over and over again. He wants you to come out. Come out. Or he will give us over. And God is a God of love. Jesus says, here I am. This is, this is really who God is. I am love. I'm love. Yes, Lord. We've been taught in error in the spirit of lies of antichrist hey i've been called the devil i've been called the antichrist i've been called the snake i've been called you name, you name it they don't call us all kinds just be ready be ready and i hear the lord saying it's asking you today will you take my hand he says i'm bringing you out of bondage so we'll be careful when you say yes it's going to cost you everything right now all those who you think loves you, or you see who they say love you, will turn against you. Are you ready for it? He says, but I'm giving you life and life more abundant. You have so much to gain after this right here today. Amen. Amen. So we're going to close, but as always, we always close in prayer. Um, God, Dad, do you want to lead us in prayer today? Amen. Gracious Father, we just thank you, and we honor you for this day. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying that this is the day that the Lord has made. Someone has been made free. And where God has freed you, you're truly free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Father, I pray that your word would stimulate the hearts of the people who are listening today. Move in their spirit, move in their soul, Father Lord. Matter of fact, I speak the word of life into their soul. I speak deliverance, restoration, salvation, eternal life, and having the more abundant of it. I pray that your people reach and come to the magnitude of their ministry, reaching their full potential in Christ. We thank you. Oh, Father Lord, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, as your official man, Father Lord, as your leader, God, I come in the resurrected name, Jesus, whose I am and who I worship today. Take authority in the spirit realm. God, to come against every seducing spirit, every spirit of error, every enemy that have come against your people today. It is in your will, Father Lord, that your people be free. Free to worship. Free to praise. Free to go forth, God, and do the things that you've called them to do with no fear. And I bind up the spirit of fear because fear is not of God. When I remove the spirit of fear right now, we give you the strength to move forth and take that step. In the name of Jesus Christ, over the airwaves of this line, to all those that are listening today, Father Lord, there is a fight in the spirit, man, because every principality and every demonic force that have come against us. But Father Lord, we know that you've given us the power over the powers of the devil, all the powers of the enemy. 
You said you've given us power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, so we exercise this authority this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, liberty, and I speak the blessings of God that make it rich and add it no sorrow to be upon the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, 